witches. So how many <laughs> witches have you had sex with? I, in terms of like, they, they're like, I'm a practicing witch. Okay. Um. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Design Exchange Podcast. I'm Thomas Grove, and with me is Alex McCarl. 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 Son of Carl. Good man. I didn't know him myself, <laughs> but uh, I met Alex years ago in Vietnam, mm -hmm. where we both used to live. Right. But even though I kind of knew you tertiarily for a while, sure, it wasn't until you hosted uh, the Icarus Music Festival. Right. Right. Um. And then I was like, hey, can I please perform there too? <laughs> yeah. That we connected a little bit closer. Mm -hmm. Since then, you moved to Japan and you've been here for about 10 months and in Osaka in the Kansai area. Yeah. And that's about to end. Yeah. I'm moving to Guangzhou uh, this Friday uh, with my girlfriend, Kate. Uh, been together for like four years. I don't know why I'm like, you know, I feel like this need to like, okay, this is the history of our relationship. But yeah, we're moving to Guangzhou simply because uh, the ESL jobs in China right now are just offering a lot more in terms of like uh, support and salary compared to Japan, which it's not great. Is it just kind of when I was living in Vietnam, mm -hmm. whenever I heard that somebody was leaving? Yeah. Um, I always feel a little sad. Oh, you know, don't leave the party so early. Right, you know? right. I mean, leaving the country, but mm -hmm. it kind of feels like you're leaving the party. Yeah. And uh, it, like, it's just getting started. Yeah. Like, you know, like it, we just had like the first moment of the party where it's like, hey, it's in full swing. And now you're, you're like taking off. And when I, um, I don't, did I see, uh, I don't know if I saw a status update by you or you told me in a message, but when you said that you were leaving uh -huh. Japan to go to China, I kind of also felt the same thing. So now I felt this twice with you. Okay, right. <laughs> so this is like yeah, the, the negative emotion, you know, double the impact. Yeah. yeah, of course. Okay, there's maybe three topics I definitely want to try covering today. Okay. How and why you started teaching. Right. And whether or not you like it and like if you think you're going to keep doing it. Sure. Probably the, the, the topic I'm most interested about, though, is talking about your music, mm -hmm. uh, because this podcast is mostly about people working on creative stuff. Right. Lastly, you know, we talked about this a little bit at the cafe, but, uh -huh. you know, f feeling like a loser, sure. you know, that kind of general topic. Yeah, no, of yeah. course. Like self-loathing is definitely an important part of being like... A human what do you think is the best order to do these in? I'm going to let you determine it because you're the master of ceremonies. You're the MC. I think uh, we'll, let's try them in the order that I presented them. That's absolutely fine. And then as like the teaser, mm -hmm. I'll use the last one. Okay. About self-loathing. Sounds good. In the intro. You're perfect. And get perfect. people hooked. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, always the hook with self-loathing because I feel like everyone can relate to that. Except for like, I don't know. You, I'm sure there's one guy that's like, I, I don't hate myself at all, you know? Man, actually, that's, a, I mean, I'm really excited to get to that topic. So mm -hmm. uh, let's try to do the English topic quickly. Sure. I can, I can move through <laughs> let's it. See, I let's mean, see. it's because it, the English topic is one of those conversations I've had with like a hundred people at a hundred different bars. Like, how did you get into teaching English? Uh, so I can sum it up fairly succinctly. You want right. me to try? Yeah. yeah let's, let's see if that. I can do it in under five minutes. Okay. okay I'm going to try. Okay. So I had always wanted to be like some kind of teacher as far as the profession's concerned. And at the time in Portland, Oregon, I was working as like, you know, barista, restauranteur, like wage slave, just like serving people coffee. I worked in a place called The Melting Pot, which is like a fondue restaurant. One of those chains that's reasonably overpriced where everyone's sleeping with everyone else and like... You know, like you go into the coat room and so and so is hooking up with so and so, and it was just like gossip and nonsense. And I couldn't get a job teaching in Portland, Oregon, because to become an adjunct professor, you've got to have a master's degree. And at that time, I was like barely able to like finish my BA. Uh, I had a friend who had taught in Korea for about three years, and I messaged him. His name was Kyle. I was like, Kyle, can you get me a job in Korea? And he was like, yeah, you know, like totally, if you want to know more about it, message me. And I did. And he was like, 
if you want to teach ESL abroad, what I recommend for you is going to Vietnam. And I was like, what? Vietnam? Like, it was completely off my radar. And I did some research, and it seemed like the only thing I knew about Vietnam was, like, the war, you know, like everybody else. I had, like, very little in the way of, like, information about it. So, my, like, my perceptions of the country were, like, completely informed by, you know, politics from, you know, decades before. Uh, but Kyle was, like, very insistent. He's, like, people there are amazing. Like, you know, there's good jobs to be had, but it's way more, like, unrestricted. And it's just, like, a lot more of a kind of environment where I felt like, you know, someone like you would thrive. And I thought to myself, like, okay, I want to travel and I want to teach as a profession. Like, I'd be crazy not to go, essentially. So that's kind of, like, what got it like started the other aspect of that i'm not going to be able to fin sum this up in five minutes is my grandma ran a boarding house when i was a kid for like students from other countries so like japanese students or middle eastern students or uh you know chinese students and my experiences with them growing up like running into one room and playing famicom like you know like nintendo except like the japanese equivalent and like playing Rockman, not Mega Man, and then having him explain, you know, like all the different like you know symbols because of course I can't read katakana or hiragana or anything like that, uh, and then trying to explain to kids at recess like, oh, I played like the Japanese version of Nintendo, and they're like, no, you didn't, you know. I think like that planted the seed of like wanderlust, like oh, like I want to go to the countries where like these people are actually from and like you know see and experience like the reverse end of what they did in America. Like, so the like impetus to go was like, you know, that seed was planted a long time before I actually decided to go and be a teacher. Okay. So now like, yeah, to sum up seven years, I like showed up in Vietnam. I got a job reasonably quickly. My first friends were all Vietnamese. I really actually quite enjoyed teaching English for a number of years. By the end, I was less thrilled about teaching English as a subject, and I moved on to teaching other things, which I really enjoy, like teaching music and specifically counseling and working with kids to kind of like fulfill their dreams and life's ambitions. So working with like Vietnamese kids, Chinese kids, half Malaysian, half Chinese Vietnamese kids, or like whoever, and like helping them sort of like... Uh, you know, like develop their like creative ambitions. So whether that's like making comics or making games or programming or doing film work and that kind of thing. And in that regard, I'm still really interested in that. I still like teaching English, but I don't think it's going to be a vocation for like the rest of my life, but I, I would love to continue being a teacher. So in a mouthful, that's, that's my teaching trajectory. When I saw you interacting with your students at, uh, the underground music event that oh, you're right, performing right. at here, mm -hmm. uh, I really saw this like a uh, teacher personality, uh -huh. you know, like you were um, very kind to your students, you know? I'm, I'm glad that you like brought that up. So I was teaching some older Japanese ladies like English in, uh, in Osaka and I had this philosophy with my students where and it started in Vietnam where the thing that I enjoy doing more than anything else in Vietnam is like there there are no rules. I mean, there's rules, but like they're largely interpretive. It's sort of like that scene in The Matrix where like Morpheus is like, you think you're breathing oxygen right now? There are rules. Some of them can be broken. So I was teaching English in Vietnam at this place called Seafault. And it was like kind of a joke place. You had a book. Uh, you were expected to teach they didn't really pay very well. The students were really awesome, though. And one thing that would often happen is, like, the lessons would be way too difficult for them. And eventually, one day, I just lost it. I was teaching this book called International Express that would have exercises that were like, okay, we're going to run a restaurant scenario, and, you know, I want you to buy a bottle of wine, a bottle of Beauchelet's. And they have these dialogues about courgettes and, like, chartering planes. And I was just like this is fucking nonsense. And I'd send the book like twirling into the air. And uh, 
you know, my students are like, teacher, teacher, what is chartering a plane? And I'm like, you don't, you don't need to know that. And I was like, do you guys want to like practice your English for real? And they were like, yeah. I was like, do you really want to learn? And they were like, yes. And I was like, okay. And I was like, we're going to go to Fam Lao or we're going to go practice English with foreigners because the only way you're really going to learn is if you just like practice like every day. So I want you to come with me. All my students were like 20 to like 30 years old. So like they were of age. Like it's not like these are kids. And I was like, we're going to go drink on the street. You don't have to drink alcohol. If you want to get a soda, get a soda. And you're going to go practice with open-minded, drunk people who are going to want to talk to you. And they were like, teacher, like, you know, what if they don't want to talk to me? And I'm like, believe me. No one wants to talk to you more than drunk people. Just ask them a question and they're going to go on a tear. And you're going to practice your English in an authentic way rather than just like, you know, like reading these ridiculous books about like first world problems and like these inane dialogues about, you know, Peter Crothers and his castle in Scotland. You can talk to some guy from Scotland with a Scottish accent and try and make sense of an accent that's going to be really difficult for your ear and like train yourself to like speak to people in an organic way that's not like my name is my i come from here this is my favorite color this is my job you know all this like inane sort of drivel so anyway we did that and then after like uh school was over uh, you know, like classes would end and I'd be like, you guys are no longer my students. And they'd be like, oh, and I'd be like, you're my friend. So like come to a party at my place. Uh, I was staying in a rather big place at the time and my students would come and I'd have them interact with like, you know, like people, uh, just, you know, like a mix of Vietnamese and foreigners in like a naturalistic setting where they could like practice their English in like this, like kind of like organic way rather than like the prescribed, like you know, school dial, you know what I'm talking about, like these like dialogue routines where it's like, okay, like you're at a bookshop and you want to buy a book and you're the sales clerk and you're the person who wants to buy the book, and, you know, all that. And like that carried over to Japan a little bit. I was like, hey, I've got this show on Friday to these older Japanese ladies I was tutoring. Do you want to come because I'm not going to be able to make the lesson rather than just canceling the lesson. I'm like, just come to my gig. So anyway, that was a long winded answer, but there you go. Yeah. I don't know you as a teacher. Right. I know you as a ambient experimental electronic musician. Sure. And sure. the organizer of a electronic music festival. I, I guess we could call it an electronic music festival. I think we had like what, like three acts that don't quite fit the profile. Really? Yeah. So there were the Lola Zolas. They were kind of like an acoustic two piece. Um, this sort of like opened things up. And then there's like James, no, James and the Manderbeeks did not play it, but Make on Delta Force played. They were sort of like a dub, like uh, a dub trio. I guess Ben was occasionally in that band. Ben is the guy I threw the festival with. He had an octatrack, which enabled him to sort of do these like dubby effects on the guitar and drums and things. But uh, yeah, mostly an electronic festival, right? I kind of, even if it, even if it was like, a, mm -hmm. I don't know, I consider dub a genre. Form of electronic like, music. Yeah. That's actually very valid. Yeah. Completely. I mean, like, maybe some of it's quite analog, but certainly there's, um, at the very there's least, you have reverb involved. going on. And a lot of it is, is using the, yeah, yeah, it's utilizing the technology, like the RE20, you know, like King Tubby and... Uh, yeah, exactly. Yes. I have a... Uh, Black Ark Studios. The the friend... Least... My friend Aaron Shin first introduced me to Dub. Uh-huh. And um, I think he described it something like being high at the end of a very long hallway or something like that. That's a really good... <laughs> you know? That's pretty good. That's... Yeah, I like it. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Fair enough. It makes you feel like you're high and at the very... At the end of a very long, dark tunnel. Right. And yeah, it's a good remix. I mean, essentially, when I think of dub, I think of like, yeah, in delays and this sort of like uh, specifically a this specific kind of delay, like a tape echo, that tape echo effect that's like famous, this like wah, 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 wah. And like, uh, 
sans lyrics usually like there's like you know like very little in the way of like vocals and it's like more about like atmosphere and space and yeah definitely hot high at the end of a long hallway that's quite good how would you describe your musical journey okay my musical journey is it going to be as meandering as me explaining how i became a teacher my musical yes, <laughs> yeah probably okay so with regard to music basically to summarize, to make a long story longer, I I had all fr- friends of mine were musicians throughout my like entire life, and I was always like of the opinion that I couldn't play music. I, I'm dyslexic, and like it's really difficult for me to do things involving like motor skills and stuff like that. I've always loved music. Uh, I got a set of turntables when I was like 18 and origi- initially my my journey with music was like I was just a fan like I just liked uh, I liked a lot of different kinds of music like uh, I like electronic music I also like you know this can sound so pedestrian I like rock music I also like jazz you know like um, I like you know different strands of music uh my dad exposed me to a lot of stuff my mom exposed me to a lot of stuff my uncle was interested in like dub and uh that's where like that comes from so i was interested in music and most of my friends were musicians they played music and basically i woke up on my 20th birthday and i had kind of dabbled in music before and i sort of realized like i looked at my life and i realized like oh all my friends are musicians um And all I do is talk about music and talk about the sound of it and what I would do with it and what I would do differently. Like, what the fuck am I doing? Like, I'm not a writer. Like, I thought I I fancied myself a writer at that time, but I I didn't write at all. Um, Or at least I wouldn't show anyone my writing. So at that point, I decided like, okay, I'm going to like dig out my old keyboard, like, like a Yamaha, one of those like Yamaha keyboards with like Rompler sounds, like, you know, like a flute, like a hundred sounds or whatever. And I taught my, slowly taught myself chord progressions. And I, I had lost my turntables because I loaned them to this like hipster girl I had a crush on in my art class. And then that was like the next wave of my musical journey is like, I lost my turntables. So I had a thousand dollars worth of vinyl that was just useless and no techniques to play it on. So I took the money from my shitty melting pot job and I bought my first synthesizer, which was an Alasis Ion. And that was like my first foray into like digital, like, you know, like, you know, uh, like electronic music production, I guess. And I got an amp. And then from there, yeah, I mean, I played around with that. I had a very modest setup for an incredibly long time. But like the main... That that continued for a number of years. And then when I moved to Vietnam, the thing that happened was I didn't have any instruments with me because, you know, you only have like a very limited amount of things you can bring on a plane. And I, I, I brought nothing. And I was so hungry to play music. And I ended up meeting this guy named Brian Kaleda who ran a shop called I Know. And he used the iPad as a teaching tool. Uh, he was teaching kids how to like do various things with the iPad, whether it's like, you know, how to play games or how to like use Google Earth or any number of other things. But the other thing that the iPad uh, class was, was there was a musical component to it, where initially I was hired to teach as an after school teacher, teaching kids how to use the iPad to like beatbox. But as I started using it, I realized like, oh, this is an incredible composition tool because suddenly you had a program that was really simple, uh, like GarageBand, which was like a very simple DAW, a digital audio workstation that anyone could use. And it had a very limited set of parameters, which actually is a criteria that I still sort of like swear by today, which is having a program or synthesizer or a drum machine that is incredibly simple to learn, that has a very limited set of parameters that anyone could learn within like, I don't know, a day or a week, and you exhaust all of those parameters. And then within that, you've learned everything that you can possibly do with it. And then you're forced to sort of think laterally about what you could do within the like limitations of that program. Um, 
And then that is sort of what sparked my musical journey because I use the iPad now almost exclusively as a performance tool when I play live. And um, yeah, that's kind of, that's the trajectory that I've been on. And I've been doing that now for, I don't know what, um, uh, 10 years, something like that. Using the iPad for about seven you have an iPad sitting in front of us right here. I do. I do. Maybe instead of only talking about your music, yeah. you can show us some of what you got going on here. Yeah, sure. I would be happy to. I'll sum up this program as best I can. What's the name of the program? Well, we'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> that's a really good question. That, that, that's a very good question. It's called Sampler, and it's one of the earliest iOS programs. And essentially what it is is... A sampler, like, okay, big surprise there. The reason I love this program is because it's got a very limited tool set. Essentially, the way I've described it to other people is it's like it, it's like if you took an electron box, I don't know if your listenership is familiar with electron boxes, and you took like one-tenth of the functionality of like an octatrack, you put it in a visual touch-based environment, and you remove the ability to do any parameter locks or anything like that. So it's fairly simplistic and it's like quite limited in terms of like the, what it offers. But then within that is like the simplicity and the ability to use it is like, it's just incredible. Like you, you only have two LFOs. So there's, six tracks of audio and then I can load up any sample I want and add like slices to that sample. So like right now I've got like this, I could add like a drum machine if I want, like, let's see, let's just go into a drum machine. Okay. So I've got a drum machine sound now. Then I can add slices here. Like I could have like, you know, like a kick here. I could have like, you know, like a snare or whatever else going on here. Okay, let's build like a simple pattern. Turn off that delay. Okay. Let's turn this down to 60 BPM. All right. So now we've got a kick pattern going. Then we can just add layers. And the thing I like about Sampler is like, so I'm gonna just quickly add some layers here. Using, I'm using an arpeggiator right now that's like, I'll just like make a pattern, here we go. Now, is this something that you're primarily using for live performance or do you use this like in a compositional setting as well? Good question. Okay, so I use this for live performance, but also like when I'm composing, I like to use it because like as an initial springboard for ideas. So like I'll work through something and I'll just like kind of jam and then like I'll find something that I like and then I'll recreate it and I'll record it part by part. Or sometimes, like especially if I'm doing something ambient that doesn't involve drums, uh, I can just you know record the whole part, uh, you know, like recording that into an interface and then having that go into like a DAW later, and then editing it or adding effects or you know adding the the long hallway, you know, of dub with me stoned at the end of it. Okay, so. You can see that I've got one phrase going on here. And each each of these phrases has like some features. So like I have this filter here. It can be a low pass filter or it could be like a high pass filter. What I'm actually doing, I should explain what I'm doing, is I've used this delay to like 
the delay is synced to the BPM. And each of these lines is like, you've got your like triplet, you can do quintuplets or whatever, and it's all synced to the BPM. Then you've got like these uh, like attack and decay, like very simple attacks and decays. And then if you move it to the furthest right hand corner, it suddenly becomes like a looper. And you've got, you know, two bars of looping. But if you set the time in half, suddenly you freed it up to be a four bar looper. So I've got it going at 60 BPM, but if I double the speed of it, it's like moving at 120 BPM, if that makes any sense. So it's just like half of the speed. And this is a way of having like, uh, it's kind of like painting with sound. So like, I've got this going right now enough of that but like if I was to go like this let's see got a delay and this is just the one phrase and then we've got like a little LFO here so like let's just set the, some shit up so I've got one LFO going right here and then I've got my like filter going and then I've got some reverb here and that's this is all you got for your phrases and then I've got some like gain like distortion here then you have the same set of effects on the master channel. So I could have like this delay, it sounds like this. Or I could add another delay here on the master channel and it's gonna sound like this. And I'm a huge fan of using like one delay and then having that sync to a BPM and then being modulated by another delay. So like you get this nice, like, if you can imagine like the sound, like I can take away the delay to show you the difference. So this double, but now we can get into some really dubbed out shit. And what I can start doing is stuff like this, where I could record like a sequence. And then I've got it modified here on the master channel. So I can like filter that. And that's just gonna loop forever. So suddenly we're like painting with sound and it's like the most fun thing ever. Yeah, I can't, okay, so this is the really funny thing about Sampler is like it's got this set of limitations and people have asked the developer you know, can you please add, you know, automation and better MIDI compatibility and stuff like that. And he's working for Apple now and just doesn't have the time to do it. Uh, but you can kind of make up for that by using other programs, like a looping program will enable you to record the automations. The other workaround for the automations is what I'm doing here, is uh, using it as a looper by using it as a looper, I only get four bars of recording time, but then it's gonna record everything I do with the filter and everything I do with like uh, the LFO or anything like that. So let's, let's like try that again. So like here I am just recording. And if I record the only things that it's going to record in terms of like the recording process are volume. So you have access to volume. And you can have multiple like instances, like I could touch it like this. You have one long sample there that's been cut up into different um, segments, right? right? Exactly. So and then you're triggering just, them just by touching them directly? Yeah, exactly. So it's like, it's a touch-based sampler. What I have here is one sample that's like multiple, uh, in this case, chords that and then uh, I can just use slices to like, okay, so right now I like turn down the volume. Uh, like I can have no slices there. And then you can also switch between like, uh, you know, like you're like different, like right now I'm using this kind of bow program, but I could just as easily like switch it to like uh, an arpeggiator. An arpeggiator. 
And then like you can kind of do that in real time, which is cool and can have a really cool effect. And then we can kind of switch between them. So like we'll go back to the bow and I could go back to the arpeggiator, you know, and do any number of things. And then, uh, yeah, go back to the master effects. We can filter that, we can add a delay, but I'll show some of my like tips and tricks. So like right now I've got this effect like this. When you're performing live, you're combining this with a uh, keyboard as well, right? Right. Okay. So For like your melodies. Yeah. So one thing that I'll do is like, I'll take like a uh, live input from like, like a hardware synthesizer and I will record that into a looping program that then records into sampler. So I can take like live feed from what I'm playing or improvising and then record that in here. And essentially it's like, it's kind of like, like the metaphor that I use, it's like having like different colors of paint. So like you've got like all of your stuff lined up, like you've got all your shots if you were like making a film and then it's like editing in real time. So I've got all these different like phrases that I've sort of improvised and that I'm playing with and then I can record the ones in and it's like this repeated process of like live editing. So the first step is to get useful phrases that can then, and then it's like, you have to kind of like engineer the dream as quickly as possible. Um, that's probably sounds incredibly cryptic and esoteric, but that's like the closest way I can explain it. So maybe the best thing for me to do is just like, just shut up and then I'll just do some shit. And you can ask me questions about what it is that I'm doing and like, uh, uh, I'll explain it. Typically what I do is like a fusion between like ambient and like beat driven material, like a kind of deconstruction of, uh, I don't know, like techno or house tropes. So like, let's, let's just like make something. So let's add some attack here. Okay. So that sounds kind of cool. Let's add another delay. Let's turn up the tempo or let's double the this. So we got to like a little higher register. One thing that's sticking out to me as kind of interesting off the bat with yeah. this is that you know, I I primarily use a tracking program, a tracker. Right. Uh, in my case, Renoise. Yeah. And I think it's pretty good for composition, but without some kind of external hardware, it's definitely limited in terms of expressiveness. It's, it's limited in terms of... Um, playing it like an instrument right right it's more like you're writing sheet music sure right and um what's kind of interesting here is how first and foremost you have your tactile interface of expression yeah that's okay so so for me in terms of like my interest like as a like performer the thing that i'm always interested in is like how to move away from how best to move away from like a situation where like I'm playing the same, like the same phrase or like the same like sequence of like Ableton recorded, you know, like patterns and whatnot that like, okay, I'm going to turn this, I'm going to tweak this knob and then I'm going to do this and then I'm going to like play this arpeggiated sequence. Like 
I never know what the show is going to be, and sometimes that like ends up in total disaster. Like sometimes, uh, like it completely falls apart. But more often than not, uh, I find that if you trust in the process of just like you, you have some vague idea about the feeling of what you're trying to channel, uh, and you've saved enough, like uh, like you, you're able to like get the beginning kind of off the ground. Once the plane is in motion, then you can kind of just kind of, kind of go wherever you want. And sometimes it results in disaster, but more often than not, I find that it like works out. And it's usually because unless you verbally start panicking, the audience doesn't really know that there's like anything wrong. Like until you're like, oh shit, like I'm fucking it up and you know, like you start sweating and all this stuff like or start like you know like throwing up your hands in the air like generally the audience is just there kind of nodding their head and they just assume that it's part of the show so as long as you remain calm and like you kind of work through whatever your perceived mistakes might be or whatever the show will generally like work itself out and i started playing this way about four or five years ago when i saw my two friends john who i mentioned to you earlier at the cafe and alec they were just, uh, they were on stage at this festival back in Saigon called Don't Feed the Monkey. And I saw their set and they were performing. And I was like, oh, this is like so cool. And they look like they're having so much fun. And I walked up to them after, and I was like, that was fucking great. And they, uh, they were just doing this jam with like two electribes. Like one was like a synthesizer from 1999 and the other was this other like sequencer. And then my friend Alec had like one of these tiny Korg Volkas uh, you, do you, you know the Korg, like Volkas, like little tiny boxes? They're like battery powered, like budget synths. Okay. So I like approached them after and I was like, guys, like I love what you were doing. And they were like, uh, cool, like thanks. And I was like, I'd love to play with you, but like, you know, like how long did it take you guys to rehear or rehearse that? And they were like, rehearse? Like, we just like, we just like, we, we didn't know what we were gonna do beforehand. And I was like, oh my God, like that's so amazing. Like that's how like I always wanted to play, but I like never had the courage to kind of like do it by myself before. Like it took years of me jamming with other people to like kind of like work up the courage to like figure out my own live set. Because one thing about like playing improvised electronic music is like, it's so easy for things to go wrong, but when you have another person there who's doing the beats or adding additional textures or timbers or whatever, it's so much easier to like, oh, I've dropped the ball, like Atlas shrugs and like the world falls down, but like my, my like homie's there to like save the day and makes everything a lot easier than if you're like just by yourself. So at this point, do you prefer performing solo or do you prefer um mm. performing with a with, with a, du some, a duet a duet uh yeah i i always i'm always more interested in collaboration than i am performing by myself i find performing alone can become masturbatory quite quickly because i feel like as producers and performers we build up this like bag of tricks and we kind of tend to rely on them. And the exciting thing for me, especially when you're playing with someone that you've never performed with before, is they'll throw curveballs at you that you never would have anticipated. And it's up to you to sort of like, kind of adapt to their play style in real time. And that's always, that's always an exciting place to be, which is like uh, just out of your depth. Uh, if you're like completely underwater, it's terrifying. Like I, there are definitely times where like, I, I was performing a set in Japan and I had intended to perform it in this very specific way and everything that I wanted to do like didn't work. And I was limited to this very narrow set of options. And of course, you put faith in your set, it's going to work out, but often not in the way that you intend to. So that's always exciting. It's always a danger. But like at this point, I can't really perform any other way. Like I don't know how to compose music in a DAW and then like, okay, now I need to translate that live. It's like the opposite actually. It's like, okay, I'm gonna jam this out live and then hopefully uh, 
you know, I'll find some way to transcribe it if I want to record it. And that's, yeah, that's kind of the nuts and bolts of the whole thing. When it comes to using an iPad for music production, mm -hmm. is this the only tool that you use or do you use any other apps? I do. I use, a, I use, I use like some synthesizer apps. Like, let's see, I can go through like some of the other stuff that I use. Um, Borderlands, I like a lot. It's a granular synth. We can go into it. I can explain it briefly. So we've got some sounds here. And essentially what this program is doing is taking very tiny snippets of sound and creating a constant, like kind of like a drone. And like, you can see there's a waveform here, but like what this is doing is it's taking tiny grains of sound and just playing back those grains. So like a grain of sound is like, I, like, I don't know, like the tiny, like a sliver. It would be like the equivalent if like, if we have a wooden table, it's like a sliver within a sliver of like a sound wavelength. And if you play multiple versions of it, you can start to get these kind of really nice soundscapes. It's not the amplitude, that's like just a different part of the wave. But if we click on it, we can like change the amount of voices, uh, you could change the pitch, you can alter the vibrato, the volume. So like here, it's like a little bit louder. We can add multiple voices. We can take voices away. So let's get rid of that cloud. Let's like one voice. Duration. So that's like going super fast. That's just like essentially white noise. Then we like add a longer duration. Let's add some vibrato, let's add the width. One thing that I often find is a problem with iOS in general or just digital in general is it can be a little bit like cold and often the high frequencies, like they come through way too much. So one way to get around that is I use a lot of like external effects pedals and things like that to warm things up. Uh, I really like Strymon's pedals. Uh, I use like a dig and uh, they recently released another pedal that's called, uh, what is it called? The Volanta, which is pretty cool. It's based on like uh, the dub sort of like, you know, legendary RE20 tape echo. And it's a digital pedal, but it's got like really, really, really nice tone to it. Like it sounds very organic warm and analog and it's really great for digital because you get that that flexibility of a touch based screen but then when once you have effects pedals you still got something tactile that's like physical that is not i mean like obviously the ipad's touch based it's physical but it's not like turning knobs and i like having best of both worlds because then you've got the flexibility and the like you know, the versatility of digital, like a kind of Swiss army knife of audio. But then with the like one function per device use of like an effects pedal, which is like incredibly tactile and really nice for adding like uh, things like feedback and things like that that make the performance a lot more dynamic. I've played around a little bit with some tools on iOS for making music, but I never really got into it, but these, these tools you've shown me today, um, you know, make me want to. Yeah. Okay. So the reason... actually I would love to like have these interfaces, yeah. but still use like kind of connect these interfaces to Renoise or something. Well, this is okay. So like, I feel like the iPad plays really well with, let's take the mic back. It's a really nice device to use in combination with other things it doesn't play as nicely as people would like in terms of like midi compatibility and stuff like that but if you're willing to suspend like all of this like these ideas of like oh it doesn't connect and the, the clock doesn't sync and all of this stuff if you're willing to suspend that uh i find that it can work really, really well in tandem with other things if you like accept the limitations for what they are. Like it's only going to get better right now. Would you rather have one iPad or two iPad minis? 
Like what would be a more ideal setup? One iPad or two iPad mini? What what kind of iPad? Like, you know, an iPad of this size okay. or two iPads that are half this size. What would be better? Uh, two iPads is better than one iPad in general. So I've, I've performed with multiple iPads. I have four or I've had four. I gave one to my friend, an iPad one, which sampler works on iPad one, by the way, which is, it's one of those few programs that's like, can work that far back in the iOS. I guess it's from like what, like 2000. I, do you remember when the first iPad came out? Uh, yes. It's like 2007 or 2008. Um, Am I going way too far back? Yeah, I think so. 2009, maybe. Maybe. I think it's 2009, 2010. Anyway, whatever. In answer to your question, I would take the two iPad minis because... Yeah, just because it just gives you so much more flexibility. When I perform live, I have two iPad Airs. I want to go into the space that my creators are creating in. Or, sure. You know, I kind of like seeing people in their own environment. It's true. And this is where I created, man. Like when I first came to Japan, I was like ultra depressed. And I would like sit in this like room. I did the score for the 17-year-old kid I've been mentoring in Saigon. And I was just like, like seriously, like at my like wits end waiting for my certificate to like come in so that I can properly work in Japan. Um, I wasn't hired for like four months and I like did this like score for his like short film and it came out really well actually. Um, but like, it's just funny. Like you're in the process of doing something creative in a room where people are like constantly walking in. It's like, what are you doing, man? You making beats? Are you making beats, bro? And it's just like, nah, I'm doing the score for this movie. What? Cool, dude. I think in this case, because we've got the camera yeah. running and you're holding a microphone, I think he was pretty respectful. He's like, oh, it looks like they're recording something. I better. No, no, it was totally yeah. cool. Like, no, it's fine. Like, actually, this is this is not even <laughs> at all in relation to Josh. This is like just like this is just a nod to like shared living 101. It's just like you invariably you're going to have people using a space and like you want to use it for something, but like, you, I don't know, like someone's there, they're cooking or whatever. And it's like, this is like, just like communal living, you know, living with other people. I'm sure you've had roommates before, you know, I did. Yeah. I had roommates during university and then at some point in Vietnam, right. Uh, we got a villa. Uh huh. And that's always nice. But to afford the villa, you know, we had to have f five people living there. It's a nice upgrade. And um, it was it was cool to have our. It had a swimming pool, and uh -huh. you know, it was cool. But it was weird to always be coming home to seeing strangers on the couch or whatever, because it's right. five people inviting friends over. There's always gonna Rand be strangers in the Rand house. Knows. So, and like at some point, you like piece together that they don't like no one knows who this person is on the couch <laughs> right. yeah. like it's like a like a like a like a remnant of some last like last week party i mean the older i get the less i want to have mm -hmm. any kind of bohemian life yeah however uh -huh. it's not to say it won't happen again right for either financial or potentially other i mean it could it could be for financial reasons or it could be for just to just to change things up yeah, yeah no i like because like yeah you isolate yourself which that's like, the, that's a risk of uh you know um if you have your own if you're i mean your in your case you're living with your girlfriend so it's a right. little different but if you're living by yourself mm -hmm. in a one bedroom or a studio apartment mm -hmm. and that you just never left yes yeah, you just like trip out on yourself and like, you know, your art or whatever it is that you're doing and like order food and like, yeah, you never have to leave. So this is a, I think a good segue into the topic of, um, failure, fa failure, <laughs> ina inadequacy. <laughs> I was mentioning in the, in the coffee shop, how online, I think there's a lot of, okay, there's one, there's, there's this one, um, phenomenon mm -hmm. where People tend to post things that make them look good on social media. Sure. So there's like these, you hear these news reports of, oh, uh, teenage girls have super high rates of depression because mm -hmm. they're comparing themselves to right. all these other people. Yeah. Do you want some more water, by the way? Arigato gozaimasu. Yes. I don't even know. What do I, how do I say you're welcome? Don't touch my mustache. Ah, don't touch my 
Don't touch my mustache. Don't touch my mustache. Yeah, but I think it sounds like "Don't touch my mustache." That's how I remembered it. No, you gotta have those mnemonic devices. <laughs> uh, it's also kind of similar to "de nada" in Portuguese, if you or Spanish or, or Spanish. So um, it's the same in both languages, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you is different, but you're okay. welcome is the same. Uh, uh, Gracias versus um, ob obrigado or something like that. Gracias. <laughs> With the, like, there you go. That's a Spain accent, That's right? Or Spanish. Barcelona or something. Yeah, yeah. Barcelona. Yeah. Got a bunch of those guys in Saigon, kind of sp Spaniards. Really? Yeah. I mean, I've, I don't know if I've met many Mexicans, but certainly met a lot of Spaniards. Hold on. Before we go down this rabbit hole of like a trajectory oh, should. that I've, 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 <laughs> I should back up and up, delete up, this. Up and up and up. <laughs> we will back up and delete it. But like you were talking about what we were segueing into something. Oh, yeah. Into that like, train? Yeah, depression and stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I want to talk about these kind of topics in general to whatever extent we can get into them. I think, okay, we have like a an array yeah. Of the smorgasbord of of topics that are kind of related, quasi linked to stuff this, like yeah. depression. Uh huh. Stuff like you were talking. Okay, you were talking about like the, you're not the girls on Instagram. Yeah, that's, that's the thread so that the, you were there, on. There's that. Okay, but that's like those are like middle school or high school kids, uh -huh. maybe university kids. Sure, we're way older than that. Indeed, right? Yeah. And then you'll see, kind of on this other level, you have motivational speakers and. You know, TED Talk type people. So we'll like put like Tim Ferriss or like uh, Tony a, Robbins. In there you there. go. Tim yeah. Ferriss is like a, a good example. Somebody who's always talking about um, life hacks and right. you know how to mm. improve yourself, yeah. self improvement, mm -hmm. starting businesses, entrepreneurship. Right. I think it's really easy to like you from the outside. You say, "Oh, here's like a couple steps to getting success." Right. But actually, success I'm finding is super hard and oftentimes short-lived as well well it can be elusive and like uh, yeah like as you say like it comes in like bursts like okay this endeavor was successful or i was successful here in this business for a while but then like you know like this phase or whatever you know comes along and you know like wipes it all away um i don't know if you're familiar with a friend of tim ferris's writing you know ryan holiday at all Ego is the enemy, and he wrote like Obstacle is the Way, and that kind of thing. He's like a huge, he's sort of leading the charge for this idea of like a return to the Stoics, like he, like Greek Stoicism, um, uh, and like Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Like he's, he's like a huge proponent of like people like getting more value out of their life by like accepting that terrible things are going to happen. And just like preparing yourself to deal with it on an emotional level and just like knowing it's kind of almost like Zen like, like knowing that this is an inevitability that things will go wrong. The only thing that you really can control in that situation is like how you react to it. Anyway, that that's one thing I've been trying to practice semi successfully as a means of dealing with that issue. So the, I guess the philosophical question is Yeah. How to formulate this is a little tricky. Do your best. Americans, <laughs> yeah, specifically, yeah, uh, can can. Okay, so here's what's here's what's going to be weird and interesting about it. Okay, I'm going to make a generalization. Please do about Americans. Indeed, but then I'm going to turn around and like, uh, totally redeem yourself. Say how like. It's not only Americans, I think. Yeah. So Americans are victims of this Protestant work ethic. Right. Where, at least if you're from the Midwest, yeah. you know, you always... I think things go one or two ways. If you are a company man mm -hmm. and you've got right. a steady job, you're providing for your family, sure, good enough. Uh -huh. But... If you're younger, you if you're if you're like hopping around from part time job to part time job, right? If you're freelancing, mm -hmm. if you're trying to be an entrepreneur and start your own company, the question is, are you doing enough? Mm -hmm. Are you really doing enough? Right. Like you could always be doing more for that company. Like, are you staying or for late yourself or late or whatever, late right? enough or like putting in the time or the hours or like all that? 
And then where I want to say, well, maybe this isn't necessarily a, um, exclusive to America. Uh-huh. Now, it does seem that Europe cares more about vacation time and, and you know they've a lot of places have five weeks vacation a year or whatever right. like having some versus, sort of work-life balance yeah, it's like something reason, like, reasonably like not like torture right yeah not necessarily 40 to 100 hours work weeks sure and so and in america you're lucky to get like what one week two weeks a year like yeah. like this is if you have a good job quote unquote but we have uh i was gonna say okay that seems like a it's it it's not unfair to say that Americans are characterized like that. Right. However, uh-huh. uh, Japanese certainly have salary men have to stay at the office a lot. Mm-hmm. Right. 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 Um, whether or not, no, regardless of how productive they are. Mm-hmm. And then Vietnamese are hustlers. Yeah. Right. Indeed. Yeah. Like a lot of Vietnamese are working uh, a full time job and then like two part time jobs or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's in a bubble economy. So there's, sure. I think all around you, like visual cues that you should be achieving more. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's fun to go to this kind of rooftop bar and share a bottle. And guess what? Those are very expensive bottles. Yeah, sure. You know? Right. Like these sort of like, um, I mean, like, well, call a spade a spade, but like empty signifiers of like, like financial success, we'll say, yeah. you know, like buying the most expensive bottle of uh, sake or wine or whatever, you know, and like going to some like like high-end club and buying all of your employees like you know some incredibly expensive dinner or whatever that yes and uh and so the question is Mm -hmm. it's not i mean uh this isn't a question like and and please give me the answer to it it's more like an open-ended question this is a the the philosophical thing that we need to ponder Mm -hmm. is um It's fine, man. Take it. Yeah, it's, this is. Um, so my girlfriend complained to me the other day yeah. that I'm like not doing enough. Right. And I, uh, I quoted uh, the Tao Te Ching, mm-hmm. which said, "In pursuit of um, the world, in pursuit of uh, society, one does more and more every day." Mm-hmm. But in pursuit of the way, one does less and less every day. Interesting. One does less and less until one day one does nothing at all. Right. And when and when one does nothing at all, mm-hmm. there is nothing that's not done. Right. Which is, uh, I don't know how, how well that ties into the stoicism idea there, but um, there's some overlap. You know, there's definitely overlap there. Now I think this is a problem that affects a lot of people. Uh huh. Um, but I, I wonder if it affects artists more than it affects, uh, I don't know. Like your average, like, it's the, just the, like Joe briefcase. Like, do we, do we only have meaning in our life because of our, uh, financial earnings? We have it because we feel that we're, um, uh, making a contribution. I think it's making a feeling like you're making a contribution is more important than, Mm-hmm. Than uh, for for like happiness than than the money explicitly, but I mean, we, but still we live in this world that has where we're always being marketed to, right? right? And you know, just to pay for your expenses, you still need money, mm-hmm. right? I've uh, I've rambled. I've now turned into the rambler. It's all good, man. And this I, is how it goes. You know? This is like. This is like the nature of like, yeah, let's, uh, so let's, let's ask each other an open-ended question that we can like have a discussion about and like pause and like, actually let's like shut everything down and come up with a, a dialogue tree okay. that can, we can move towards. Can we do that? I think it's possible. So you, we were talking about torture and misery and somehow we, we got onto a trajectory of like the whole like gamut of existential crisis, which there's a lot to unpack with that. So, um, maybe, uh, I don't know, like you recently started or you have been working on a business. What's the, what's that all about? Yeah. Now I'm interviewing you. Yeah. It's not that these, um, 
existential crises are uh, that I'm mm -hmm. manufacturing them. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's definitely you have a factory action existential that, crisis. You know, there's there's yeah. actual mm -hmm. things happening in my life that are making me feel inadequate. Right. Of course. I started a fashion brand mm -hmm. several years ago, mm -hmm. and I spent um, the first year doing lots of prototypings of one jacket. Right. And then I spent the second year, mm -hmm. we kind of built a studio and um, hired a full-time seamstress. Right. And then in the second year, we built prototypes for 20 items, mm -hmm. um, multiple prototypes, on, like... And we pretty much got about 20 items to finished, mm -hmm. though that could include a, a boy version and a girl version or something. Right. So Men's maybe wear, 10 things, but like two versions of each thing. Yep. Um, so that seems like more productive. Uh-huh. And then I asked my son um, if he'd like to go look for a bag for his Nintendo Switch, which he got for his birthday. And nice. he said, no, I want the bag that Papa designs. Ah, very nice. And then I, that's good. since it's my company and it also seemed like a good idea, I yeah. kind of said, okay, we're going to put all the jackets on hold. Uh -huh. And f for like the next year, we're going to focus on making a bag for the Nintendo Switch. Right. And we did. We made a bag. We uh, experimented with like... We made the first versions in-house, and then we tried to find factories that could actually produce it. Uh -huh. And we had to aud audition like maybe five to ten factories for the leather version and five to ten factories for the cloth version until we could find mm -hmm. companies capable of producing it in the quantities we were looking to produce in and at the quality we wanted to produce at. Right. And then we brought it to Kickstarter, and mm -hmm. that was actually successful. Um. And then we went into production and it had a lot of hiccups, but we um, still did uh, admirable for a Kickstarter in terms of delivering to our customers. Right. Um, I think we did kind of slip on our shipping dates by two to four weeks, mm -hmm. but we still got everybody their stuff before Christmas. So Good, good, good. That's um, an important landmark to hit. Yeah, which was important for us because I'm, I was sh certain that a lot of them were probably going to be Christmas gifts or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, so that's all quite good. But mm -hmm. getting to that point mm -hmm. was incredibly stressful. Yeah. You know, right. a lot of lost sleep and a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. You know, you would show up at the factory and then see that they've they've just ruined 100 bags because they're doing it the wrong way because even though... Yesterday, when you were there, they you, they had ironed out some issues. Right. Today, one of the key people was sick, and they replaced him with someone else. Mm -hmm. And they're doing a horrible job. And like everything they've done has to be redone. Right. There's, there's a lot of st stresses. Y you, uh, we had a box of stuff in in customs mm -hmm. in Canada for like I don't know two weeks to a month or something. It was stuck in customs for a long time. We right. just couldn't clear it for yeah. whatever reasons. Like we didn't have. Well, mostly because we don't have a Canadian company mm -hmm. to import it, but uh, it took a while to get the paperwork in order to get that through. So by the time we finally fulfilled our orders, yeah, um, I was burned out uh -huh. and I wanted a break. It was basically Christmas, so I was on break. But yeah. then afterwards, I just kept being on a break, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I actually kind of fell into depression. Yep. And, um, it was, it's why I started this podcast mm -hmm. because I was like, I need to force some sort of projects. I need to... something to get me out of the house and talk to people. Right. Right. You know? Yeah. I can't just be uh, held up inside. Yeah. In parallel to all this, I mean, like I can't really tell this story properly without including this, you know, I'm separated from my wife and my son lives with her. Uh huh. And uh, they live in Japan. Right. And I'm kind of toiling away in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And then uh, finally we got our project out the door and I can come to Japan. Right. And be able to spend more time with my son. Yeah. And I've missed out on years of his childhood. Right. Because of our domestic situation. Yeah. Because you're estrangement. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, 
I haven't done a lot of work since Christmas, but I have spent a lot of time with my son. Good. Which fulfills me and a lot. It's time well spent. You yeah. know, it fulfills me a lot. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it doesn't pay the bills. No. Right? And uh, any money that we made through our Kickstarter is is mm-hmm. is depleted. Right. <laughs> at so this point. Those funds are gone. Yeah. Right. One thing that you got going on when you're trying to do something new is like, there's this whole learning curve to, here, some more water. You got this whole learning curve that like, you know, there's all these things that you assume that you know how to do and then you like try to do it and it's actually way harder than you think. And like, you know, it's like similar with like music or editing. Like once you're trying to teach yourself something new, like it's like all these things that you never considered, like that are elusively obvious, like, oh, actually, I have terrible anxiety when I play music live. Or, like, actually, like... Do you? Um, yes and no. There's an initial insane, intense anxiety that everything is going to go wrong when I, like, perform. But then once I start performing, I find that, like, instinct just kicks over and it's just like a lumbering machine. I always assume that... I experience like, I think everyone is sort of like experiencing like time when they're performing like much faster than the audience is processing things. So for example, like I'll do something and I'll feel like I'm stuck doing the same pattern again and again and again. But then if someone's filming or the performance is being recorded, I'll review it later. And I'm like, oh, actually that worked out really well. Like there was a nice pregnant pause there, but it wasn't like this like, drop dead like mic dropping silence like um and that everything is completely fine so there's yeah i mean like anyway the whole point of this thread is that like whenever you're doing something new regardless of what that is you might have some experience in some other way that you feel like is going to like translate so for example like i've performed live in a music capacity so it's like oh yeah surely i could like you know um like do a podcast or something like that but then like a camera goes on and i immediately i can't make eye contact and you know like there's just like this wave of total anxiety and nervousness that like creeps in but like for example like today like we've been doing this for like about an hour and a half two hours now and like it's getting easier even as like we're doing it in real time but it's not as nice as when we were in the cafe and not recording Sure. Yeah. Because when the cafe and there's no recording, there's no pressure. And that's when you're getting like the best stuff. Like that's when I was like talking about, uh, you know, the motorbike and you were like, oh yeah. And then there just happens to be like a female patron at the cafe. That's like, oh yeah, it's where I got this scar and Lao And like, you know, everything comes out as this like organic bit. And then you go to like do it live again. And it's like, okay, let's bring that same level of like magic. And we'll have like, you know, our dialogue is not going to sound like this, like a stilted sort of like, Hey, I have this tone where I'm like pretending to have a real discussion, Frank discussion with you, but actually like, I'm like just trying to like sound like we're having, you know, a discussion, like the affectations, you know, creep into the mix. What was the, if we could try to recall it, what was the, the gold nugget we were, that we came across when it came to talking about, uh feelings of general inadequacy you know okay i don't know if there was any gold nugget but for me my takeaway if i was able to like synthesize the like discussion down to like a couple like things that i remember is that like i think the thing that i was saying i can't remember is something along the lines of like we get to a certain age and i think we feel like we have to have achieved these like particular milestones Like, it's like, okay, like, I've started this business and I should be, like, selling this many units or, like, I should be this well-established as a musician and, like, you know, I should have, like, put out a record or, like, you know, by the time I'm 25 or 26 or 35 or whatever. And, like, ultimately, like, it's all bullshit. But, like, this notion of success or failure is something that it, like, exists in our minds. But, like, it's still, like paralyzing all the same 
And like, I don't know, just to like tie things full circle, like you were talking about like, we have like society's expectation of success. And then we have like Japan's expectations of success. And then there's the like Vietnamese version of that and the American version of that. And then our own like, you know, parental figures or spouses or ex-spouses or whatever that is. And then that's like a mathematical equation that gets divided by our own like, you know, residual self-image when we look in the mirror and we're like, oh, have I achieved X, Y, and Z thing? Have I like provided for the people I love in the way that I feel they should be taken care of? You know, and like, yeah, it's like really hard to deal with. Um, but like, I feel like we all have to make peace with that in our own way. You mentioned one thing uh, about success at the cafe where you um, said that luck was like a probably a big part of it. Oh, okay. You know? yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, that's like the elephant in the room, the like elusively obvious thing that I forgot. Yeah, luck. Luck is huge. I mean, we can pour, like, let's say that I'm an incredibly skilled musician, which I'm not. Like, let's say that I'm like classically trained and I have exquisite taste and that I'm really good at socially networking with people, which is a huge component. I mean, like, how one makes it as a musician, how even you define that these days is fucking crazy. Because as an independent musician, it's like, unless, anyway, I'm on a tear here. But, like, the long and short of it is that, like, there's a huge amount of luck in this equation that was, like, resulting in you being at the right place at the right time, meeting the right people, and then again, there again, like, how are you defining success? Is success your ability to like put food on the table every month and like make rent? Is success like living in like, you know, like the countryside and like Vietnam and like maybe not having a shit ton of money, but having like a ton of freedom and free time to make music? My girlfriend's a writer. Uh, you know, she publishes some things. She's a Canadian writer. And like, we were talking about this the other day and like for her, it's like, I write, you know, because like I enjoy writing and to like the extent that I like, I can put work out there. Obviously I would like a bigger readership and people to read it. But like, as long as I'm producing work that I enjoy, I get enough fulfillment out of like my career as a teacher. Writing is just like, that's like a hobby for me. Obviously I'm sure she would love to have more of an audience but like at the end of the day ultimately she's doing it for herself more than anything and in regard to my own life i mean that's why i do music not just for me because it helps me connect with other people that are like like-minded individuals and there's such a like sense of community built into every city surrounding that music so i don't know it's kind of a like a roundabout way of addressing this mm -hmm. question of like luck but like what, let me ask you um, yeah. something more personal then. Like, Please do, yeah. Pry away. Do you have a goal? An end goal? Like yeah. what's 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 like the end game scenario? Yeah. Like before, before we're bones in a box, before yeah. we're dust in the wind, dude. Okay. My end goal is ultimately right now. Like who knows? This could change tomorrow. It could change after this podcast. But it's to go to China to earn enough money to get back to Longbyang, which is like countryside outside of Dalat, buy land, build some kind of house, and be able to work on music and have built a kind of social network all over the world, not on the computer though, peer to peer with people in China, in Japan, in Vietnam, such that I could sort of like clear the path so that my friend Josh, who makes ambient music, could go to Vietnam and play. He could send someone from Kansai to China and I could like find a place for them to stay, for them to get reasonably well paid for a gig. And then they could go and like have someone from China come to Japan and play and like have this kind of like hub of people that you could sort of call upon to like, if you wanted to do a festival, you know, if you wanted to do like a smaller party, if they wanted to play a gig, that all of those people could play. And like, that's not necessarily like a career track. That's like, just like, as far as like where I would like to see the music go is to be able to like have like, yeah, just a network of people around Asia that are like sort of like-minded 
and connected through music. Maybe not necessarily that they play the same music, but like that you've got this like peer network of people that you like legitimately know, you know, not just like on like some social media. Um, and then for me, myself and I and my partner, uh, being able to like live in a country side and like have some measure of, I don't know, like peace and quiet before like the world comes to fucking violent and terrible end. Um, and, uh, run an after school program for kids like in Vietnam. So like, is I there can... enough of a market like in that countryside area you're talking about? No market to speak of, but like I'm moving to China to earn enough money and hopefully invest enough that like I could teach, I don't know, do like VIP kid, which is like teaching Chinese kids on the internet, maybe a little bit on the side, uh, own a house and teach an after school program for free like i would i wouldn't want to charge for these are kids that don't have any money and have like i don't know like a lending library where like they could come and like learn how to program music or they want to like learn how to like uh i don't know learn um english or they want to like you know read some comic books or something that like that would be made available for them so this is like a very like hodgepodge of ideas but like yeah, the loose idea is essentially move China, earn money, go back to Vietnam, buy land, be able to kind of like move, like have like agency to move around a little bit, like flexibility to like, you know, if I wanted to like go to Japan to play a show, I could do that. But most of my time is spent in a place where I like know my neighbors and like have some sort of community and not like but less community than here well no like i mean yeah i have a community here but no, no i mean like ideally you would have less community than oh you mean in terms of like proximity to like people like in my immediately like living situation right, right. yeah yeah so ideally not so much like people like having like you know super loud sex or coming home like wasted and like puking in the bathroom yeah <laughs> yeah that would be ideal community without the, the disruption yeah there you go community without disruption i like that that sounds like like a catchphrase for like one of those like infomercials for like like a company video or something community without disruption you know yeah. da, 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 like rainbow wipe <laughs> tagline corporate tagline yeah corporate tagline I used to do like voiceover work in Vietnam and that sounds like something they would say like like the send off of the voiceover work like you know taking you to the top or like you know some other banal platitude like you know what what is my my contract in China say ethical oriental wisdom and western scientific spirit that's why taking yeah. you to the top whenever you see mm -hmm. asian companies with english taglines they they never sound natural right it's like it's like a direct word for word translation sure or or even if it isn't it's it's like it's cheesy or something well you know? look they always look like they sound good on paper um but they don't they don't run it by a native speaker so it might even be like grammatically correct right but then when you say it out loud, it's like, no, this is an awkward sentence. And they don't really understand the concept of an awkward sentence. Like, I was trying to explain to this company that I would do voiceover work for, like, they wanted me to read this dialogue about Petrol Vietnam Company. And I have nothing to say about the company, but this is just about the dialogue. And it was like, in the year 1977, for Meg Benefit, Glorious Times, Vietnam. And I was like, you can't have me read this it's completely nonsensical and they were like just read the script you know and i was like okay like do you want me to like edit it and they're like nope just read it so i was like okay i'm like trying to read with inflection like you know some days excellent times planning wonderful keep charge you know like it's just like word salad but delivered with a kind of authenticity and authority and i get the sense that like no one English is actually going to be watching the video. It's just having that voice in the background is like somehow authoritative of some kind of like 
I don't know. I like it sounds more official. Maybe I, that's the only conclusion I can draw from that experience. Yeah. I, I did a uh, one voiceover. What, what, like for what was it? It was for a green building material from Thailand. Okay. Like maybe wood made out of bamboo or something like right. wood, wood flooring or wood walling for mm-hmm. houses. Yeah. And like the, a Vietnamese distributor for that company, uh-huh. or perhaps the Vietnamese office of that company, right. is was going to be a, a like attending a big trade show. Mm-hmm. An industry, it was like very in you know, inward. Fo- it wasn't like a necessarily public facing. It was kind of like industry facing stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, they're talking about the history of the company and like right. the the values of when it the, was founded. Their values, yeah. you know. And uh, I spent two. I spent, it was like a 10 minute voiceover. It was, it was kind of like the, like for the opening ceremonies of sure. this thing. And how long did it take to do? It took at least two hours to rewrite. Sure. Cause I was like, I, I, I can't, I, I won't. I can in good yeah. faith. Like I can't read this cause it this doesn't, this isn't actually a it. sentence. Sure. You'd right. be like, okay. And what was the meaning in, yeah. behind this part? And like, yeah. as an English teacher, like there's like my voice, inner voice, like screaming at you. Like you cannot have this as part of a product that is going out into the world. Okay, here's a here's a, actually kind of a, a good counterpoint, like Japan Vietnam counterpoints, because mm. a lot of times, like the negative part of Japan is how rigid things are, mm-hmm. but but there is a lot of cases where in in Vietnam this kind of um, um oh it's good enough, good enough is like a concept in in, in Vietnam, right? Like oh that that English is good enough for what we want to do with it, sure. right? Don't overthink it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's a lot of American movies that will come out at the same time as America here, but something like Toy Story mm-hmm. uh, will come out like a month or or two later. Sometimes it seems like four or five yeah. months. Yeah, and part later. of that is because they want because they dub it, mm-hmm. and they want to do a great dub mm-hmm. of it because it's like a cartoon in the first place, right? Sure. They put whatever like amount, whatever the production time for the American production for the mm. the voiceover work for the animated was going to be. Like the Japan version is going to have the same amount of time allocated to it, right? You know, and in, in those cases, I'm sure like whatever Japanese they're reading is uh-huh. sounds normal. It's not right. Like, did you use Google Translate to make this? S- some of the, yeah, some of some of these things though, like don't translate so well. Like my friend Josh was trying to explain to me how like there's a lot of jokes that just don't. This is just like there isn't the like language component to like understand because like, especially like so much of our culture is referential. It's referencing other popular culture garbage from like the echo chamber of time. Yeah. And like, how do you synthesize like, okay, this is making reference to like Salvador Dali, who was like the surrealist artist who's, who's this and that, but like, actually it was like, you know, a cartoon you know, that got made into a cartoon and that cartoon was done and then this character had a catchphrase and now this character is making reference to that. Like, and it's gotten more and more ramped up as culture's gone. And like, we're like living in the echo chamber of an echo chamber. Yeah. When the joke is the the reference. references. Yeah. Whether they're self-referential or like, yeah, but they're definitely postmodern in their like referential structure. Right, Exactly. If you aren't familiar with the references, it's not going to have the impact. No, not at all. Because yeah. you're completely dependent. Like, okay, like take a. Have you ever seen the show? Yeah, you made it. You made it like a, a metaphor about this, like Stranger Things, right? I think you saw my show, and you're like, oh, like, hey, some of your synth work. It reminds me a little bit of that. So Stranger Things, like, I have serious issues with this show. Like, it seems like you know, there's enough problems in the world that I, I have issues with like Stranger Things as a concept. But I think I think Stranger Things is emblematic of this thing that is happening where like the Duffer brothers are they're like 30 something. They're like 35, 36 years old. And like they didn't grow up in the 80s. They were like maybe what? Like five, six when all this like stuff they're referencing is coming about. But it's not so much like okay, you take a show like Mad Men and you have like uh 
it's looking back at the 1960s, but it's looking back at them from the perspective of like 2019. So there's a certain critical eye going on there. Like you'll have a scene where like Betty Draper, they're having a picnic and she just like throws all the garbage that was on the picnic blanket, like, you know, into the park and then walks away. And like, clearly that's like a retrospective lens. Whereas like in Stranger Things season three, there'll be like a scene where L, the like little girl season in three, season three, please, please don't. <laughs> you can talk about season two. I'm, I'm still holding off on season. You're three. still, yeah, you're yeah. holding, you're holding off. Yeah. Season. No, I mean, I haven't seen it, but like, oh, hold, okay. hold, hold on, like, which is one moment where we're not spoiling anything. Okay, I won't spoil anything for this audience. All right, it's just they go to a mall and there's like girls just want to have fun playing, and like there's no like, hey, like. It's just like, remember malls were a thing in the 1980s and now we're going to like cue the hit. It's like, so there's the needle drop of Cindy Lauper. And it's like, see, it's so like the 80s, like we've got every reference or like the kids dress up as Ghostbusters. And it's like, see, remember Ghostbusters? Like that was a part of the 80s. Mm -hmm. And it's none of the like, like all the tropes are there, but like there's none of the like feeling like, so for me, when I think of the 80s, one thing that like crops up as a thing that like you know older like gen x people will talk about is parents like just not being around so like you know you grab your bike and like you like just go to your friend's house or whatever and then you come home by a certain time but there isn't this like constantly like checking in with like by phones or anything like that because no one had a phone in their pocket then stranger things doesn't really like tap into any of that I think season one did for sure. A little okay, a little okay. Like no, let's let's have a healthy debate about yeah. this. So like, g give me an example of well, where the, you the, felt like they did like that. In the kids are going home after playing D and D, right? By bicycles, okay. At like let's say, I mean it's dark, but sure, you know, let's say it's nine p.m. And uh -huh. that's like when like the main like when the the boy gets abducted by the bad guys or whatever right. by the monsters the so upside down monsters yeah so like in episode one it's not really a shouldn't really be a, a spoiler this happens in episode one yeah no if they haven't seen it by now so um, this is like this is fair game at yeah. this point okay you know what it is though like Stranger Things to me uh -huh. is more of a um, it's not necessarily a uh, retelling. It's not a. It, what it is is it. It's an homage to '80s movies. Right. Okay. You so we, yeah, not yeah. to real '80s, but to '80s movies. To the content that was so created like, at that time. Um, so ET stuff like ET stuff yeah. like uh, the the Goonies. The Goonies. So very, very, it's very Steven Spielberg. Right. Esque. war games yeah you know all like john hughes yeah and yeah in terms of the uh slasher films it, yeah in terms of like the john carpenter the content <laughs> in terms of the the characterizations of the the, 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 the like, right when we have this type of character we have that kind of there's that guy and that guy i can you know sure. like it's 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 as if it's as i mean this movie could have been produced in the 80s or this tv show you know if they had higher budget right you know if they thought differently about tv back mm -hmm. then like this could have been made at that time right and so it's like we've kind of grabbed it and brought it to now and, and playing it so i do think that in the second uh and third seasons when they're like and this one's about ghostbusters and uh -huh. this one's about the mall right at least, like that's what the tr the trailer for the second season like showcases Ghostbusters, and the trailer for the third season showcases the mall. Right. I don't know if that's jumping the shark or just being too heavy handed or whatever, but I mean, like for me, like okay, like take for example, like the first season, like there was a lot of like synth work. I forget the name of the duo that they hired to like do the intro and all that stuff, and I, like that was really cool. But they didn't have like a huge budget, so there's only like a couple needle drops in it. But then, like, you get around to, like, the second season, and there's just, like, a lot more. Like, it's just, and, like, specifically, like, the touchstones, these are, like, all, like, super well-known tracks. It's not, like, it's, it's not, like, the more obscure the material you choose, like, somehow, like, that's going to, like, make for a better show. But it seems to me that, like, 
the kind of thing, the material that they were chosen is like very much almost like uh, what Cameron Crowe does, like where he has like these like it, it, they're so itching to use the song. Like the song is more important than the scene. Like it's elevating all the emotions in the scene and it's all coming from this like cultural touchstone. So you were saying like it could be made at that time, but it can't be made at that time because it's being made at that time with the knowledge of everything that like came of that time. Right. So yeah. in the cases of this, these specific, specific popular songs right, right. iconic songs being used and because like maybe at that time that song wasn't yet well known or right of course right? yeah it's only in reference uh-huh to like it's since become like a famous thing right and they do this in black mirror as well like i don't mean to like immediately derail the conversation and take it to a whole nother trajectory but like i don't know if you saw have you have you seen the latest Black Mirror at all? No. Do you watch? I the saw show the first Black Mirror? the first season. Okay, so you're familiar with this yeah. concept. Anyway, without any spoiling anything, there's like a newer the newer season of Black Mirror, the one before like the holiday special. It's like about Bandersnatch, a game, and within the episode, the guys mention. Uh, That's like the choose your own adventure. Exactly. Exactly. One, right? A choose your own adventure interaction one. The guy specifically is like, you know, you're like, uh, you need to like, you know, like you need to listen to these records. And the records he chose were like uh, Tangerine Dream. And there's nothing wrong inherently with Tangerine Dream. But it's like a very obscure band at that time. And the idea that this guy was like listening to specifically that album and that record, it's like it's almost like it's since they've become much better known and much more popular, but I feel, and like, he's also like, he's a game programmer who's being portrayed as a cool guy, which there's no fucking way right. anyone was cool <laughs> as a game programmer back then. And there's nothing wrong with that. But like they, like he lives in like this like loft apartment and has this like super cool, like kind of like punk, like Susie and the Banshees kind of girlfriend. It's like, no dude who made games at that time was going to be a cool guy. Like, people who played synthesizers at that time were dorks. I should know. I, I'm still a dork. Like, they, they were Devo-loving Mark Mothersburg. Like, you know, they were just, like, average guys. You know, they weren't, like, they don't have the reverence and the sort of uh, respect that they have now. It, I mean, as limited as it is. I don't know. I don't know. This is this is <laughs> way off topic, but yeah. I... Uh... It's fine. I feel like we've we've ventured into dark waters at this point. Um, I'm just like spouting off my like innocuous thoughts on popular culture. So my son likes the Marvel movies. Okay, great talk. And to some extent, the DC movies, but okay. certainly the Marvel ones. Okay, Avengers and like exactly. All that, right? And he's just seen all the the modern stuff, right? Uh -huh. And so he's like, I mean, we didn't start at the beginning because he's ten now. So we started at like the first Avengers movie. We started like there basically, right? Uh, so we've gone back now that he's seen every that he's exhausted all the material and mm -hmm. gone back and watched Iron Man one, two, and three, and, mm -hmm. um, and then we started watching Spider Man one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. Which which iteration of Spider Man? Like the 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 Tobey Maguire one. Oh wow, the yeah. way, way back Spider Man, yeah. like three three iterations yeah. ago. Okay, I would have to say it doesn't really hold up. It's my critique. I, I tend to agree. Yeah, it doesn't really hold up. It didn't really hold up for me when I saw it. <laughs> yeah, like initially, because like the new one is amazing. Like the the new spider, the new level of Marvel Spider Man. I, is really I, great. I, I, I haven't seen it. I'll have to take. It's like everything you that. want out of it. It's like you're watching a cartoon, but when he takes the mask off, it's a real person. Sure, right. I feel like the trajectory. Like we've gotten more conversational. As it has gotten gone. as we've gotten into topics that are more fun to talk about <laughs> well, I feel you know? like that's or, kind of the nature yeah. of like or at least we're talking about like we're not talking about the same topics that we talked about at the cafe well the, there you go the other thing is i think like like it's always nervous talking to someone that you haven't seen in like a really long time because you didn't feel i didn't feel nervous there at all okay but now that we've turned on all the fucking cameras and all this all the bells and the rickety racket it's and just like, something you know i don't think it's uh, for me it's not that we're being recorded yeah it's just the um how inorganic it is 
Sure. It you know? feels like super force. Yeah. And it's like, but as the more we're talking, the less like I, I think about the camera. And I'm also looking at you. Oh, like well. before I was like <laughs> looking away. Oh, looking wow. yeah, man. Yeah. The, I was like going to my first episode one of this yeah yeah i was like my heart was pounding <laughs> just like you know like a mile a and then like i get there and i'm like interviewing my arm is like completely stiff yeah and then <laughs> you know it was i felt very awkward right and how was uh, your guest like how did they he seemed you know i don't know what his interior state was but <laughs> he's just shit you know, other than continuing to hit the microphone that he seemed quite <laughs> cool about it all right um okay but it's definitely gotten easier with each with each one i mean but you know i'm not as i'm sure when when you're joe rogan who's doing like four four or five episodes a a, a week for years yeah he's many, also many been, years he's also been like an ultimate fighting like champion like mc he did like the man show he's a comedian as well which like what like we're just gonna go on a quick tear i i rather i'm gonna go on a quick tear as a comedian like unlike a musician all you have is a mic right you have oh. a mic and like an audience and if you fuck up it's like so naked you don't have like synthesizers and effects or a guitar to hide behind it's just you and you're not like singing a song you're like delivering material that you know is you is you know, it's gonna be rehearsed but like you got to deal with hecklers and all kinds of stuff i feel like that really does prepare you for you know like sh like what show busy stuff whether that's like interviews or you know like making content along those lines i am um, not going to include this but i'll just mention it for just but um oh yeah do it i saw him uh in an episode of jay's garage okay where he talks, what is what is jay's garage? that's uh just jay leno talking about cars okay he's got is like, that this is like jerry seinfeld's like comedians and cars getting coffee uh well, Jay Leno like has three airport hangers of cars that he owns. Yeah, of course. So it's a little bit different. I think a lot of the I haven't really seen a lot of that show, but mm -hmm. um, I as I gather, like some of it is he just goes through his collection and talks about some of his the, cars. The, the, the fifth car, yeah, yeah. And driving, and, driving the car. And then in some Jay cases, Leno. in some cases, he'll have a guest on, mm -hmm. especially a guest who is into cars, like Jerry Seinfeld mm -hmm. or or Joe Rogan, right. So Joe Rogan brought his car uh, to Jay's garage right. and they talk about it, but like, but when I see, like, I, I see some kettlebells there too. I also saw some video where Joe's like peddling his kettlebells from his company. Uh, and like, right. when he's in these situations, no mic in the hand. Sure. Just like talking about this car or talking about these kettlebells yeah, yeah. and like what he thinks is nice about it. Uh huh. He looks, stiff like a little bit more on edge yeah he, he like his it, posture is like not you know like when you're standing like, around you don't know what to do with your hands or whatever, yeah of right? course you know? you know it's difficult and you're also like he's not on his own turf like when he's on his own show it's like you know what's up freak bitches and he yeah. can just kind of like That's go right. into his shtick yeah so it's like especially i think because you have that as the foil right you see him in his complete element yeah that he's built for himself. Right. Like, okay, that's his element. Uh -huh. Okay, so when you see him out of that element... When he's in Jay's airport hangar, though, <laughs> suddenly, yeah, yeah. suddenly everything goes to shit like he can't. Yeah. Uh, so I guess when even when even Joe Rogan looks awkward, yeah. I guess we don't have to feel that, that bad about being awkward. No, it's not that bad. We do have a blowjob parlor outside my place, though. As now I have to, see, now I have to take a video of that and, yeah. and cut to it yeah, yeah. as a B-roll. Yeah, I forced you to do it. So I, I was telling you that like what I enjoy is like I watch customers at night. This makes me sound like such a freak. And they like look at the various price options like mm, 80 minutes for like, you know, 2000 yen more. Like, should I opt for that? Should I opt for like the like standard 60 minutes? Is that 20 minutes of extra value like really worth it for me to pay X amount of yen? You know, there's something about that selection process that's really interesting. That and watching the girls leave at like 5, 6 a.m., just like kind of exhausted, like anyone with their job, you know, but like they're in like Bo Peep outfits and things like that. And then they get on a bicycle and they go home. They don't change? No. It's sometimes like sometimes they just have like costumes on. And like it's it's amazing for me because it's like a total demystification of the like whatever you're, you know, 
your like fantasy of the situation is supposed to be. So like, you know, I don't know whether it's like an airline att attendant or like, you know, a nurse or whatever it's supposed to be. Uh, it's, it's like, they're just like biking home like anybody else. Just like, just going home to sleep, you know. Sleep's important. Yeah, it is. Especially when you, uh, you've been working hard all day. Uh, you know, whatever they do in there, I wouldn't know. So we watched... I can't afford it. <laughs> it sounds so terrible. Yeah. So we watched Spider-Man 3. Okay. Yes, you and your son. Let's get back to that. And um, uh -huh. I, I hadn't actually seen it because I think I was... Maybe I was put off by like the trailers. Right. Back what in the was day. wrong with the trailer? What's the one where he gets all emo? I, Do you know? What I mean? You oh, like the other guy, the guy before, after Toby Maguire? No, no, Toby Maguire. Uh, he like gets venom. Yeah, symbiote. Uh huh. And he becomes, as my son said, uh huh, too cool Spider Man. Too cool Spider Man. Okay. Oh, now he's too cool Spider Man. Right, right, right. Yeah, and then. Along those lines, um, I got him a pair of sunglasses the other day. Right. And he put them on. He goes, now I'm cool. Uh-huh. Right. That's, that's cool. You get a, like, super sassy kid. That's pretty weird. Yeah, but uh, but it's funny because I, I, I'm laughing along, and I'm kind of encouraging him. But I'm uh -huh. like, actually, it makes you look like a douchebag. Oh shit! Like what? What kind of glasses? What Oak, are they? Oakleys. Oakleys. Yeah. With like shiny orange. You're just like you no, know? just don't, just don't do it. You know, it's like now I'm cool, mm -hmm. but actually, cool is not. You can jump the shark with cool very. This fast. is this is this is I'm tie, I'm tying this to this whole idea of like cool, like a too cool programmer. Uh, you know, <laughs> like yeah, it's yeah, a too yeah. cool programmer. It's like, you know, the the great game programmers uh -huh. of our days yeah. are super awkward dorky guys even the cool ones and they are cool uh -huh. but not cool. not not in like the classical sense they're not cool because they're wearing um the right clothes right or listening to the right music mm -hmm. they're cool because of their accomplishments yeah <laughs> no no well no completely <laughs> i'm well i mean this is like the whole demystification of and like this notion of imagine cool like, cool is never, like, the way that, like, we intend it or imagine it as a kid. Like, for example, like, take James Dean, for example. When I was a kid, I thought he was going to be this, like, super tough guy. Like, and that that's what made him cool. Like, whenever I saw images of him and I pictured him in a movie, and I was like, oh, it was a handsome guy. But, like, I imagined him as super tough, you know, like, smoking cigarettes and, like, you know, being, like, a kind of Duke Nukem teenage character. And then I see Rebel Without a Cause... And he's like super effeminate, open nerve. And it's like, oh, it's like so much more nuanced than I ever thought. And like, that's what women were attracted to. And like, you know, that's why he was idolized. It's like, he's this like super sensitive actor and like actually has this like really like empathetic quality to him. And like, that's what made him cool. It's just, it's just never what you expect or anticipate, you know, like, like someone who, who tends to like think of themselves as cool or like archetype of cool, like, I don't know, like what, like Fonzie, mm -hmm. like, you know, like he was never cool. I thought Fonzie was supposed to be cool. And like, people were like, no, he, my parents were like, no one thought he was cool. Like, because like to be cool, like you had to be tall, especially at that time. And like Fonzie, you know, Henry Winkler's classically short. And, uh, yeah, he's like, he was considered a loser, you know? So I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the deal is with that. Shared house. That's how it goes. Anyway, we're going to, what, we're wrapping things up. Yeah, now. we're going to wrap things up, I guess. It's, right. it's been many hours that we've been hanging out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have like a SoundCloud or whatever that you, I can. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. My like music name is Casino Witch at Bandcamp. So if you look for Casino Witch Bandcamp, I'll pop up and that's my stuff. Um that's Witch like with the hat and the broom or yeah, like which one? Casino as in like a place that you gamble, witch as in like a hat with a broom. Yeah. I assume you're probably going to have like a follow-up question about no. No. No, no there's no follow-up question. Yeah, I hope it's written in your bio. 
Uh, yeah, it's just like Casino Witch plays electric music. He lives in Japan, Osaka, Osaka, Japan. Uh, that as a child, he always dreamed to become a witch who wins at gambling because of cheating with magic powers. No, I like that'd actually be way cooler. <laughs> I, I, I like, I went on a road trip and I met this witch woman who identified as a witch. Oh. This is real story. Yeah. And we had sex on a dock in Florence, Oregon at like under the light of a full moon. And I was like, oh, casino witch. She's a casino witch. But that, why casino? Because she's worked at a casino for 14 years. Oh. And she's a witch. And I was like, that's kind of that's kind of crazy. Like you're you're a witch, like you like a Wiccan. I don't know if you're familiar with that like religion. It's like this pagan religion. <laughs> and uh yeah, you work at a casino. She called herself a dealer. And like, I was really high the first time I met her and she kept on calling herself a dealer. <laughs> and like, <laughs> and uh, I was like, like, what? Like, so you're like a drug dealer? And she's like, no, like I'm a fucking like car dealer. Like I told you, I work at a casino. And I was like, I'm still hung up on the fact that you said you're a fucking witch. Like, and then somehow we ended up sleeping together, you know, as one does when you're, you know, 23, 24. It's not every day you meet a witch. I actually tend to meet a lot of witchy women. Like, that's a thing for me, is, like, women who have identified as a witch or told me that they were witches in past lives. Now everything's getting interesting. Now is, like, the interview is coming yeah. to a close. Like, now I have the thing that I'll put at the beginning. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. I, I happen to have sex with a lot of witches. So how many <laughs> witches have you had sex with? I, in terms of, like, they, they're, like, I'm a practicing witch. Okay. Um, I've fooled around with three women who have either identified as a witch or like told me they were a witch in a past life. Right. That that's like some of that is like like I don't, I don't know like what I don't, we don't have to define in terms of like what that yes they there there was a sexual involvement with three separate people. Well, Alex. <laughs> It's been great to catch up with you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks for taking the time to interview me. I I hope all of this was like really informative and, and beneficial to, you know, the the listenership. I hope it's at least entertaining. Yeah. Um if you'd like to check out Alex's music, he is Casino Witch on Bandcamp. That is Casino like where you gamble and witch like the one with the hat and the broom. That's right fly on over there and see me sometime thank you and uh we'll see you later <laughs>